Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. I'm Tom McNulty with Regaku, and I'm here with our presenter, Aya Takase, also with Regaku. I'd like to thank you all for attending Regaku's webinar series, X-ray Computed Tomography for Material Science. Our first segment, Introduction, will focus on the principles of computed tomography, and we'll begin shortly. Before we start, a few housekeeping items. We will be taking questions during the live webcast. We ask that you submit your questions during the presentation by clicking on the Q&A button on your screen. The button may be on the top or the bottom of your screen. It may also be hidden, so you may need to move your mouse to see it. We will save your questions submitted during the presentation and we'll read and answer as many as we can during the Q&A session at the end of the presentation. Please note we will not be monitoring the raised hand or chat features of the meeting software. If for whatever reason you have difficulty viewing the webinar live, please note it is being recorded. You'll be able to review the recorded beginning tomorrow. Okay, that said, I would like to introduce our speaker for today, Aya Takase. Welcome, Aya. Thanks, Tom. Thank you, everyone, for joining us for the introduction part of the webinar series, X-ray Computed Tomography for Material Science. In 1982, there was a group of researchers at the University of Tokyo, and they were studying very old trees. They wanted to know how old those trees were, but they didn't want to cut them down to look at the growth rings. So they worked with Rigaka engineers back then and built this. This is an X-ray CT scanner that goes around a live tree to look at its cross section and account the growth rings. And this was the very first X-ray CT scanner we made. If you're thinking, that's kind of cool, but how does that work? You came to the right place. In this webinar, you will learn what X-ray CT is and how it works and how it can be used for material science. So let's start with the first question. What is X-ray CT? A lot of people are probably familiar with this. This is a medical CT scanner or CAT scan and a patient would lie down on this bed and go through this donut-shaped scanner and his body gets sliced, not literally, but virtually. And his doctor can look at his cross sections of the body. And this is how a medical CT scanner is used. And the way you can use this technique for material science is more or less the same. So if you wanna look at somebody's brain, without slicing his brain, you would use a CAT scan. For material science, usually you need a little bit higher resolution, so the CT scanners will work as microscopes as well. And that's why they are sometimes called X-ray microtomography technique. And with this, you can look at, for example, fine structure of a loaf of bread without slicing the bread. And also, since it's a microscope, you can see a tiny thing like a sesame seed and you see its cross sections as well. So X-ray CT scanners used for material science are also microscopes. So I would like to compare it with other microscopes for imaging techniques. Optical microscopes, SEM or AFM, they all usually use some sort of surface reflection, scattering, or interaction. So if you look at a walnut, for example, you will see a nice microscopic image of the surface of the walnut, and you get two-dimensional image. If you use X-ray microscopes, since X-rays can penetrate into an object for microns or millimeters, if you look at a walnut, you're gonna see inside of the walnut and you get 
whole three-dimensional image out of this object. And this ability to be able to see inside of an object without cutting or sectioning it is probably the biggest advantage the X-ray CT technique has. A lot of people probably don't know somebody else using X-ray CT technique for material science, but this technique itself hasn't been around for a long time. So how long has it been around? We are in 2019, and it all started when Rentgen discovered X-rays, and that was in 1985. Then about a decade or so later, or a couple of decades later, Radon separately introduced Radon Transform, which in concept proved that the X-ray CT technique would work, meaning that you can get cross sections of an object without sectioning the object. Then you needed to wait for several decades until Hounsfield and Cormac developed the very first commercial CT scanner. And they developed this to look at human brains. And that was in 1971, so it's almost 50 years ago. And since then, X-ray CT has been used in the medical world for obvious reasons, but not so much for the material science. And here is the reason. For materials research, usually you need a lot of higher resolution compared to the medical CT scans, and you always get information in 3D. So your file size tends to be very large, anywhere from a couple of gigabytes to 30 gigabytes. And looking at those images and just making some comments probably would not be good enough for material science. So you have to do some sort of image segmentation then ultimately quantitative analysis. And doing those analysis on gigabyte size files requires a fast computer and sometimes artificial intelligence-based image analysis. And those two things were not available 50 years ago. So a couple of other things needed to happen. For the artificial intelligence part, in 40s, people started to experiment with artificial neural network. And I'm going to skip all the way to 2000. Probably recently, you hear terms like machine learning or deep learning, which are used in very wide areas, anything for face recognition or market analysis. And they are used for X-ray CT image analysis as well. So those algorithms needed to develop over the years. And also, you need better computers to run those algorithms. In 40s, computers looked like this. And today, if you spend, let's say, $10,000 or so, you can get a pretty decent computer, and you can use it to run machine learning algorithms and apply to five gigabytes or 20 gigabytes of image files. And those changes happened roughly about in the last three or five years. And that is why the X-ray CT technique is still a little bit under-recognized and underutilized in the materials research world. But I think that now is a good time to start thinking about this technique and see if it's useful for your research. So we looked at what X-ray CT is and its history briefly. So let's talk about how it works. Before we get into the 3D imaging, I would like to start with 2D. You have an object and you put a 2D detector. And if you put X-rays through this object, you get a 2D projection on the detector. And this happens because things absorb x-rays. And different things absorb x-rays differently. For example, if you have a plate that's made of iron, aluminum, and carbon, and if you put x-rays through it, and let's say you put a film underneath, 
you're gonna see something like this. So iron is dense or heavy, so it absorbs a lot of x-rays, and as a result, film doesn't get burnt much. Carbon, on the other hand, is very light, so it does not absorb x-rays that much. So the film, as a result, gets burned quite a bit. Aluminum, density-wise, it's somewhere in between. So the gray level you see on the film is also somewhere in between. So you can see that the x-ray absorption rate is density-dependent. If you look at a sample like this, it's all aluminum, but the thickness changes. And you put x-rays through it, put a film underneath, you're gonna see something like this. And this is because the thicker the object is, the more x-rays are absorbed. So you can see that the absorption rate is density dependent and also thickness dependent. And that's how a 2D absorption imaging works. So how do you get to 3D? Before we talk about how you go from 2D to 3D, I actually would like to clarify the difference between the two. So this is a 2D projection. Everything gets projected on one plane in this case. So your right ear sits right on top of your left ear and you can't tell the difference. Once you go to 3D, which is often called 3D computed tomography, you have multiple cross sections and you can use those cross sections to create 3D rendered image. And once you get to this point, you can of course tell the difference between your right ear and left ear. So that's the difference between 2D and 3D. Now, measurement wise, if you wanna look at somebody's head like this, you would have put an X-ray source and X-ray detector like this and scan both of them around this head. And as a result, you're gonna have multiple 2D projections collected from different angles. Then you put all those 2D projections into a reconstruction program. We'll get to what this is in a second. But this reconstruction program then will spit out those cross sections and you can create 3D rendering from them as well. So measurement wise, you collect multiple 2D projections from different angles and you put them in a reconstruction program to get to the 3D imaging. But how does that reconstruction work? To explain how it works, we're gonna use this very simple example. It looks like a blue egg. And if you look at the cross section here, it actually looks like this. And there is like a yolk looking thing inside, which you can't see from the outside. So we will try to get to this cross section using x-rays. If you put x-rays through this cross section like this, since x-rays will be absorbed differently depending on what kind of material they went through, you can plot the integrated density into this direction. Let's call that projection angle zero. This is air, so it's very, very light. Your integrated density is low. This part is very thick and dense, so you're gonna have a high value for integrated density. And you do this uh, projection making process for angle zero, and you can do the same thing for 90 degrees, and you keep going as a zero, 90, 180, and 270. Now you have four projections. Then you take one projection and then convert this into a gray level. Low density is dark and high density is light. And then you stretch this ribbon into a square like this and repeat this process to different projections. So you go to zero, 90, and simply you can add those two together to get to this. 
And this might not look like much, but if you keep doing this for more projections, like four, this is eight, 24, and 120, then now you can see the cross section of that blue egg. You can see the yolk as well. So essentially, this is how the reconstruction process works. But you notice that it's kind of blur and there is a halo around this egg. And this happens because, let's uh, take a look at the eight projection view. There are some gaps uh, around the edge of this uh, image. Then you have a lot of overlapping areas towards the center. This means that there is a little bit of imbalance of the adding process, but that can be easily corrected just by adding a ramping filter. So if you add a ramping filter to this image, you will get this. So this is the reconstructed cross section of this original. So you can see that they look pretty close. And this is how you can get a cross section without sectioning an object. And this was only for one cross section, but you can repeat the process for multiple cross sections to get three dimensional view of a sample you're scanning. And this technique can be used for a lot of different samples, materials like batteries, insects, composite materials or fibers and bones. I will show you more examples towards the end of the presentation, but this is how X-ray CT works in concept. And this technique can be used for a lot of different kinds of materials. Now, X-ray CT scanning when imaging has some limitations and challenges just like any other analysis techniques. And it's important to know the techniques and limitations when you use it um, so that you, don't, uh, you would use it the right way. So what are the limitations and challenges of this technique? The common challenges include number one, it's a limited resolution, just relatively speaking compared to electron microscopes. Number two, too light or heavy absorbing materials are difficult to image. Since this is an absorption imaging technique, if the sample doesn't absorb x-rays at all or absorbs 100% of x-rays, you can't image it. The third challenge is the artifacts. Artifacts can make the interpretation of the results um, complicated or difficult sometimes, so that's one of the challenges. And I would like to go into more details for those limitations and challenges uh, one by one. First, the resolution. So what's the resolution of X-ray CT technique? This chart summarizes which technique can do what. Your eyes, they count as a tool, can easily recognize a five-year-old person a hand, a finger, or human hair, which is probably 50 to 100 microns. If you wanna see anything smaller, you're gonna need microscopes. And X-ray microscopes and optical microscopes, they can go down to about several hundred nanometers in resolution. Then that is the limit of X-ray CT technique uh, we're talking about. Technically, you can probably go down to 20 nanometers or so using x-rays, but that often requires synchrotron beam lines. With the commercially available x-ray CT systems, you can go down to one micron, uh, sometimes even down to submicron resolution. Then if you wanna see something even smaller, like individual atoms, then you're gonna need microscopes. So that's an overview of the resolution. The next one is too light or too heavy absorbing materials. So what is too light or too heavy? We looked at this slide at the beginning and learned that the X-ray absorption rate is density and thickness dependent. 
what I didn't mention then is that the X-ray absorption rate is also X-ray energy dependent. The higher energy X-rays are absorbed less by the same material. So what this means is, if you wanna look at a small low density material and good uh, get good image, you wanna use low energy X-rays to make sure that your small and low density sample would absorb enough X-rays. If you wanna look at something large or high density, you're gonna need high energy X-rays to make sure that at least part of the X-rays would get through it. So that's the rule of thumb. Now for the range of X-rays you can use, for the commercially available X-ray sources, on, you can find different sources from 5 keV to about 450 keV. And that energy range translates into in density. For example, styrofoam. That can be imaged with 5 keV X-ray. And if you want to look at something like engine parts made of stainless steel, then you want to have to you want to go to 450 keV to see them. So that's the density-wise, just roughly the range you can look at with those X-rays. The third item is the artifacts. What are artifacts? So artifacts are features you see in X-ray images sometimes that are not real. They are not coming from the samples. Those are artificial. The common artifacts include concentric rings or aliasing, which usually show up as radial lines, and streaks and shading. Rings usually come from bad pixels or non-uniformity of the detector. And this one is easily correctable. Aliasing comes from undersampling. This means that you didn't have enough number of projections. And again, this is easy to fix. You just need to collect the more projections. Streaks and shading usually come from what's called beam hardening. And this one is a little bit trickier to get rid of. So what is beam hardening? To explain what it is, I'm gonna use solid blue to represent monochromatic X-rays, the single energy X-rays. And I'm gonna use rainbow colors to represent polychromatic X-rays. They have a range of energy. And the artifacts based on beam hardening comes from the difference between what we assume in the reconstruction calculation and what we actually do when we do experiments. The assumption we are making is, so you have a sample and you have monochromatic single energy X-rays coming in and they get absorbed by the sample and come out again as monochromatic single energy X-rays. This is the assumption we are making. But the reality is you have polychromatic X-rays coming in and higher energy X-rays can get through the sample better compared to lower energy X-rays. What that means is the energy distribution of those X-rays shift towards the higher side as they go through the sample. And high energy X-rays are also called hard X-rays. And you can say that the incoming polychromatic X-rays energy shifts towards the higher side as they go through the sample, which also means X-rays harden when they go through the sample. And that's where the term beam hardening comes from. And the artifacts that are caused by the beam hardening happen because assumption we're making in the calculation and the reality of the experiments we're doing are a little bit different. And it actually is not that important to understand why beam hardening happens or how artifacts appear. 
but it is important to know what they look like so that when you see one, you would recognize it as an artifact. So those four cross sections are models we're gonna use to do X-ray CT simulation. And the white areas represent high density areas that can often cause beam hardening artifacts. If you do CT scan for those cross sections, you're gonna get something like those. You can see that the model and the simulation look different, and that's because the simulation has artifacts, like those streaks coming from the high density areas. It gets worse when you have multiple high density areas, and you see shading like this one sometimes as well. So this is how beam hardening artifacts usually look like. And to reduce it, um, you can always increase the X-ray energy to reduce the beam hardening, but sometimes um, it's difficult to completely eliminate it. So those are the common limitations and challenges of the X-ray CT technique. So now we understand how X-ray CT works and what its common challenges or limitations are. But what about the hardware to make the X-ray CT scanner? What kind of a hardware is involved in an X-ray CT system? A typical X-ray CT scanner looks like this. You have an X-ray source, you have a sample stage, and you have a detector. For medical CT scanners, it's probably not a good idea to rotate the patient. So you keep the patient still and rotate the X-ray source and detector around them. But for the material science, it's actually easier to rotate the sample and to keep the X-ray source and detector fixed. So that's usually how we do X-ray CT scans. And the major components of the system are the X-ray source and the detector. So let's look at them a little bit closer. For the X-ray source, to achieve high resolution, usually people use micro-focus X-ray sources with, with tiny X-ray spot. And the most commonly used X-ray sources fall into this category. It's a medium energy 60 to 190 kV energy range. And its power is 10 to about 100 watts. And this is the category of X-ray sources that are most commonly used for X-ray CT. And it covers a wide area. But if you wanna see something heavy or large, you're gonna need higher energy sources. Commonly available ones usually go to 450 kV, but there are X-ray sources that can go up to 750 kV. And their power tends to be higher as well. If you want to see something light or soft and you want to get high contrast, high resolution image from them, then you're going to have to lower the X-ray energy, but you do not want to lower the power of the X-ray source. In that case, you need a different type of X-ray source like this one. This is a rotating anode type X-ray source and this particular one is, one is Rigaku 007. And with this generator X-ray source, you can choose the energy from 5.4, 8, or 17 keV, but you are not compromising on the power because you can operate this one at 1200 watts. And this is a good generator to use for light materials to achieve high contrast and high resolution. So those are the three major categories of X-ray sources. Now let's take a look at the detectors. The most commonly used detectors for X-ray CT scanners are usually flat panel or solid state detectors. They are popular because they are fast, sensitive, and inexpensive. Their typical pixel size varies from 50 to 200 microns. And those are great detectors, but if you want to do higher resolution imaging, you need a little bit smaller pixel size. Then you probably want to use CCD in that case. 
These CDs are available with smaller pixel sizes and they work better for high resolution imaging. Nowadays on the CMOS, or I should say SCMOS detectors, they are available with pretty small pixel size, like this one from Andor on, comes in 6.5 micron pixel size. And by using those SCMOS detectors, you're not compromising on the resolution that much, but you can make the scans uh, quite a bit faster. So for faster scan, high resolution scan, uh, the SCMOS detectors would work better than the CCD. And those are the three major categories of detectors. So you see that the X-ray generator and the detector are the major components and they have their own specs, but the specs of the actual CT scanner comes from different parts and different uh, parameters as well. So I would like to go through a list of important specifications. Those are the specs you might wanna pay attention to when you're trying to find the right X-ray CT scanner for your research. The important spec number one is X-ray energy. Then you wanna look at the field of view or FOV. That's the area you can scan in one shot. And of course the resolution. Sometimes uh, people use the term voxel size, which essentially means pixel size in 3D. Then X-ray power. This one is actually simple, the higher the better. And the detector speed and efficiency, again, this is pretty simple. The faster, the better, the more efficient, the better. So the last two items are pretty simple, but the first three can be a little bit complicated. So I would like to look into those three items uh, one by one. First, the X-ray energy. You can roughly categorize X-ray CD scanners on in three groups. And those three groups have different X-ray energy they cover. But if you put the Y axis as your X-ray energy, then you put the X axis as a resolution, one category would be positioned here. But if you wanna see large and heavy samples, like engine parts, then you would need high energy somewhere from 200 to two, uh, 450 keV. But because you're looking at a large sample, you probably don't need high resolution. So this category covers high energy, not so high resolution on um, bulk cell size range. So that's one category. The next category is for small to medium size and medium density samples. And this area actually covers on a whole lot of different things. Anything from electronics, batteries, uh, plastic, food, even small animals, they all fall into this category. And for this, um, you need probably from 60 to 190 kV in energy. And you need a little bit higher resolution, anywhere from five to 100 microns. So that's the second category of X-ray CT scanners. The third category is for small and light materials like polymers, foams, organic materials, including plants and insects. And for that area, you need low energy X-ray source, anywhere from 5 keV to 15 or 20 keV. And because the structure you're trying to image here are often very small or fine, uh, you need a little bit higher resolution going down to one micron or sometimes even a couple hundred nanometers. So that's the third category. And again, those are three major groups or categories of X-ray CT scanners. And one of the major differences between the three is the X-ray energy their sources have. Now let's talk about the field of view and the resolution. I would like to talk about those two kind of together because they're related. So let's say that this is your sample, thus this is your sample size. 
then if you have a detector here and x-rays go through the sample like this, then this rectangular area is your field of view or FOV. This is the area that gets projected on the detector. And as you can see, the FOV is not necessarily the same thing as the sample size. The FOV can be either smaller or larger than the sample size. And when your FOV is small, generally speaking, your voxel size is small as well. That means you have high resolution. When the FOV becomes large, your voxel size becomes large as well, meaning you have to compromise on the resolution. Sometimes people say that, well, I want to scan a large FOV, but I do not want to compromise on the resolution. Unfortunately, it doesn't work that way, and I'm going to explain why. If you have a one millimeter cube you want to scan, and you use one micron voxel size, your file size is going to be about two gigabytes with a 16-bit grayscale. And that's not bad at all. It's manageable. You can do analysis, whatever you want to do with it. Then you decide to go up to 100 millimeter cube, but you're not going to compromise on the voxel size. Then your file size is going to be two petabytes. Two petabytes is 2,000 terabytes. And that is just too big. You can't even save this file on the terabyte drive. And this is why you have to compromise on the voxel size. If you go to five microns, it's 16 terabytes, probably still too big. You go to 25 microns, maybe eight bit for grayscale, it's 64 gigabytes. Now you can probably save this on the drive, no problem, but you might have a hard time analyzing it. So 50 microns voxel size is probably more reasonable. Your file size is now eight gigabytes. As you can see from this table, you have to compromise on the resolution and use larger voxel size when your FOV becomes large, just to keep the file size under control. Now let's take a look at the resolution and see what decides or determines this resolution. So the resolution of voxel size depends on the focus size and of course the pixel size on the detector side and also the geometry you use. Since X-ray scanners, uh, CT scanners you use for material science work as microscopes as well, there is some sort of magnification going on. And how does that magnification work? So that depends on the geometry you're using. And the cone beam geometry, which has X-ray source here, detector, and the sample, and you have a cone-shaped X-ray beam. Uh, this is one of the most commonly used X-ray CT geometry for uh, commercially available CT scanners. And the other geometry is called the parallel beam geometry. Again, you have the X-ray source, detector, and the sample. For the cone beam geometry, you use mechanical magnification. So you have the X-ray source, sample, and you are gonna have the sample image projection on the detector like this. And because you have a quite a bit of divergence of the X-ray beam, if you move the sample closer to the source, your projected image gets magnified. And this is how mechanical magnification works. And this geometry is very versatile and inexpensive, and that's why it's used for a lot of conventional CT scanners. For the parallel beam geometry, we use the optical magnification. So you have a parallel beam. Now you don't have a lot of divergence. Then you put the sample right up against a scintillator, which converts x-rays into visible light so that you can use optical lens to do the magnification. 
And this geometry actually works very well for high resolution imaging. But at the same time, it requires high power X-ray source. And that's because we are using only parallel portion of the X-rays and also you have to use pretty thin scintillator to achieve a high resolution. But why is the parallel beam better for high resolution? So let's compare the two. When you do X-ray CT scan, in general, you're using very small X-ray source. And that source can drift or vibrate when you're doing a scan. And when that happens, with the cone beam geometry, because you're using X-ray divergence for magnification, your source drift gets magnified as well. And you end up having a little bit blur image. And this is the reason why the cone beam geometry's resolution, which is generally speaking, on, is limited to about five microns. If you use a parallel beam geometry, even if the source drifts a little bit, because you're not using X-ray divergence for magnification, your image doesn't get blurred. So you can say the parallel beam geometry is immune to drift. And that's why this geometry works better for high resolution. And with the parallel beam geometry, you can probably achieve about one micron and sometimes even a couple hundred nanometers resolution. Okay, so we went through a list of important specifications, including X-ray energy and the field of view and the resolution, which are related to the geometry. So now we went through how X-ray CT technique works, and now you know what the major components of those scanners are and what kind of specifications you should be looking at when you're trying to choose the right tool for you. Now let's take a look at some examples. So there are a lot of different things you can do or different things you can scan with X-ray CT. For example, if you put your cell phone on a CT scanner, you're gonna see something like this. You can even zoom into individual components and see a condenser or soldering. You can look at batteries and you can see voids, cracks, or delamination, and you can see them all without opening the battery package. This one is from aluminum die casting. And those blue bubbles you see in the image represent voids inside of this piece, and they are color-coded for their sizes. And this is an example of a quantitative analysis you can do with X-ray CT which we will cover in the next webinar. You can also look at plants. Um, those images are from bamboo tree or toothpick. And you can look at composite materials as well. This one is from a carbon fiber reinforced polymer. And not only that you can see individual fibers, and they are about seven and a half microns in diameter. You can see um, packing density of the fibers. You can analyze the orientation of the fibers. And in this case, there are a couple of voids inside. So you can visualize the voids and color code them depending on their sizes. You can use X-ray CT to look at tablets as well. This one is from a soft gel tablet, and you can see the coating thickness. You can visualize the cracks inside. Sometimes you can even see um, non-uniform mixing of API and polymer in tablets as well. This one is from a very thin organic film. Uh, the total film thickness is about 80 microns. And it has a membrane filter inside, which has a very small density contrast compared to the matrix. But you can image those filters and organic membrane filters very clearly by using low energy x-rays. 
This one was a scan with the 5.4 keV X-rays. The last example I want to show you is from an insect. This is an image from an ant's leg. And by using low energy X-rays and high resolution setting, you can see the details, including individual hair on this leg. And I guess this much you can do with SEM as well. But what you can't do with SEM is to go inside of this leg and look at the details there without cutting or sectioning the sample. So as you can see, there are a lot of different areas you can use X-ray CT technique for. And I hope you found something interesting or similar or related to your research. You just learned what X-ray CT is, how it works, and how it can be used for material science. So this is the end of the uh, first session. But before going to the Q&A session, I'd like to take a minute to show what we make. So what does Rigaku make? We make those three CT scanners. And they cover different FOV and resolution ranges. The Nano 3DX is good for high contrast, high resolution, and high speed scans for soft materials. The CT Lab HX, this is your bread and butter CT scanner. It's versatile and it's bench top. It can cover up to 200 millimeters in FOV and it goes down to 2.2 micron in nominal resolution. The CT Lab GX, this one is a little bit different. With this system, you keep your sample stationary and the X-ray source and detector go around it. And this geometry makes it possible to do a very high speed scan. So you can do one scan in eight seconds. And this system is also compatible with in vivo and ex vivo CT scans. But those are the three CT scanners Rigaku makes. And if you would like to learn more about them, please contact your local sales representative if you know who they are. If you don't, you can go to rigaku.com and contact to find out who's in your area. This is the end of the first session, and we will cover data analysis in the next webinar. And it will be on June 26th, Wednesday, at 11 a.m. Pacific Daylight Saving Time and 2 p.m. Eastern Daylight Saving Time. Thank you. All right. Uh, thanks, Aya. Very, very interesting. And thank you so much for presenting. It appears that we have about uh, 10 minutes for a Q&A. And there have been a couple of questions that have come in. First one would be uh, Beth from Germany uh, writes, what is an approximate scan time for insects? Um. So scan time depends on a lot of different things, but for insects, I'm gonna say typically anywhere from 20, 30 minutes to a couple of hours. And there are times that you might do a longer scan for high resolution, but I'm gonna say 20, 30 minutes to a couple of hours. Right, okay. Um, next question is from Sumath from California. He asked just for a little bit of clarification with respect to voxel resolution and spatial resolution. That's a very good question. So voxel resolution on usually used as pixel resolution in 3D. And people say pixel resolution or voxel resolution or even nominal resolution. That means it's just the smallest pixel size you can achieve with a particular CT scanner. Spatial resolution is 
think spatial resolution is the resolution that you can achieve in the real computed tomography or the cross sections, meaning that how small of a feature you can resolve using a particular scanner. So that's the practical resolution you can get from the machine. And generally speaking, your spatial resolution number on it is higher, it's a lower resolution than the pixel size, the voxel size, or nominal resolution you usually see in the spec. Okay, yep, great answer. Um, next one comes in from Maria from uh, British Columbia. What's the approximate fastest processing time for a CT scanner? Okay, so the processing time could mean a couple different things. For the first processing or calculation you have to do is the reconstruction because your raw data is in 2D projections and you have to reconstruct those 2D projections to get the 3D view. So that's the first part of the processing. And that part takes anywhere from seconds to probably minutes. I think it's rare that it takes uh, any more than 10, 20 minutes. So that's the reconstruction. For the analysis part, once you have the image, you do the segmentation or quantitative analysis, that part can take anywhere from a couple of minutes to days, depending on how complicated of analysis you are trying to do. Okay, fair enough. Next question from uh, William Hildebrand in uh, Missouri. William writes in, what is the resolution on the ant leg image? That one was a scan with a nominal resolution of 270 nanometers. The spatial resolution in this case is about 700 nanometers. Okay. Uh, Jerry Poirier from uh, Delaware writes in, what is the max sample size and resolution for CT lab GX. On the CTLM GX, sample size wise, you can go up to 100, about 160 millimeters in diameter and roughly 400 millimeters in length. That's the sample you can physically fit on into the machine. And resolution wise, you can go down to about 20 microns and FOV is 72 millimeter in diameter. Okay, uh, next question is another question from Sumath in um, California. He wants to know if there's a different term in commercially available software for what you call the ramping filter. I guess he's trying to identify whether or not a particular piece of software has that function. Um, I think when, well, let me put it this way. The simple ramping filter, like the one I use in this demonstration, uh, looks just like a letter V. It's a straight line V-shaped ramping filter. Um, most of the commercially available reconstruction programs use a lot more complicated filters to deal with a lot of different kinds of noise reduction, uh, artifacts reduction. And Different programs use different names, but when somebody just says a ramping filter, it could mean a couple of different types of ramping filters. There is an um, agreed convention in terms of which one is called what. Okay. Next question from uh, Joe Neely from uh, Illinois. He asks, can you scan a sample in water? <laughs> That's a tricky question. Um, I'm going to say yes, but it will be tricky, meaning when you do a CT scan, it's very important your sample does not move when you rotate it. If the sample moves, everything gets blurred. So if you have to keep your sample moist or wet on my guess is that's probably one of the common reasons why people want to scan something in water. You need to figure out a way to physically make the sample stable so it doesn't move around in water. And if you can achieve it, yes, you can scan sample in water. 
water is not that absorbing. So unless you have a whole lot of it, uh, it shouldn't get in the way. But the sample holding is the tricky part. Okay. Next question is from Maquin from California. Uh, can you explain again how X-ray power affects the scan? So X-ray power, just to clarify, not the energy, but the power. Um, affects the scan time in the sense that the higher the power is, the shorter the scan time is when you compare everything at the same image quality. And it works this way because the more x-rays you can get in a limited amount of time, um, you can reduce the noise level and get good quality image. And that means if you don't have a lot of x-ray photons, you have to spend a long time to collect a lot of them. But if your power is high, x-ray power is high, you get a lot of x-ray photons in a short time. So you don't need to sit for a long time to collect them. So that's why the higher power means a shorter scan time. Okay. So we have a question from someone that is not Jerry from Delaware, but seems to be using his account. And he asked about a follow-up question. What sample sizes can be put in the Nano 3DX? In addition, what are the field of view, excuse me, and resolution? Okay, on the Nano 3DX, um, there is actually quite a bit of space inside of the machine. So the sample size-wise, it can be uh, up to 50 millimeters in diameter. But the FOV is um, relatively small because it is um, geared towards high resolution scans. And the largest FOV you can have on the Nano 3DX is about 10 by 14 millimeters uh, if you use the CCD. And it's about 10 by 10 millimeters if you use the SCMOS. Resolution wise, um, with the maximum FOV, your resolution is about four microns. If you reduce the FOV down to about a half a millimeter cube on um, your nominal pixel voxel resolution is about 270 nanometers with the CCD and 325 nanometers with the SCMOS. The spatial resolution for both the detectors on is about 600 to 700 nanometers. Okay. Uh, Joe from Illinois says, if you have a sample with drastically variable density, could you scan with two different energies and merge the data sets? Um, yes. If, I don't know if merging them together would be the best way to deal with it, but definitely you can use lower energy to focus on the lower density side and see the features there that way. Then you do another scan with higher energy and use that scan to look at the denser areas. It might be a little bit tricky to stitch them together depending on uh, the density of the sample. Okay, uh, Robert from the US writes in, can you comment resolving regions of the samples of different mass or density, mass resolution and spatial resolution? I think he's referring to, is there a difference between the two and what are the values? So when you have a sample that it has, let's say two areas with high density area and low density area, and they show up as a different gray level in X-ray CT scan. So let's say the denser area looks lighter, whiter, and lighter areas are darker or closer to black. And from the gray value, you can differentiate those two. You can say, okay, this area is dense, this area is less dense. To quantitatively calculate the density from the X-ray CT image, you need to do some sort of a calibration because the gray level is just relative. You can say this is a higher, this is lower, but you're not getting the exact density from them. You need some sort of calibration standards to estimate the density. Um, the 
I'm going to um, guess that when he says resolution for density, um, that means how small of a difference of density you can see or resolve. And that depends on the absolute density value, of course. But it, it's usually, uh, I think a lot of people try to see small density difference in light materials. So I'm going to talk about light materials. Let's say density of one or two uh, grams per cubic millimeters, the centimeters. In that case, uh, we have seen about 0 0.13 uh, grams per cubic centimeters density difference in polymer by using um, copper AKAV radiation. If you use a higher energy X-ray, uh, you can't see this difference, but by choosing the right energy of X-rays to image the tiny difference of the density, uh, you can see that small of a difference. And the spatial resolution, um, as we talked about a little bit before, essentially means how small of a feature you can see or how small of, um, I guess, either line or spot that you can recognize in the image. Okay, um, I have another question from Todd in Texas. Uh, what programs do you use for data analysis? Uh, there are actually a bunch of different analysis programs out there you can use, uh, just to name a few. A Dragonfly, Aviso, um, BG Studio. Those are all commercial uh, programs. Uh, you can also use ImageJ or Fiji package. Uh, those are free programs. Um, so there are a lot of choices out there and different programs can offer different uh, analysis techniques. And that's something we'll be covering in detail on in the next session of the webinar series. Okay. Um, another question from Bill in Oregon. Um, where can we see the different machines that Rogaku manufactures? Uh, so there are a couple of places. Uh, and I'm going to give you examples in the U.S. You can go to USC and see both the Nano 3DX and the CT Lab GX. Um, University of Illinois Champaign has the same combination, the Nano 3DX and the CT Lab uh, GX. University of Delaware um, has those two as well. And of course, you can come to uh, Rigaku US headquarters in Houston, Texas, and we have those two and the CT Lab HX as well. Okay, great. So that's about all the time that we have for today. Okay, so thank you very much for joining us, and we will see you all next time. Thank you.